Good morning. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Thursday, February 11th. We're joined today by the Yukon's Premier, the Honorable Sandy Silver, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Once again, our sign language interpretation is provided by Mary Thiessen, and André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate will provide French translation as necessary. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have two questions. Before we begin with our speakers, I'd like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having a problem, please email eco at yukon.ca. Premier Silver. Thanks very much, Pat. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's great to be here with Dr. Hanley and Mary on the uh, traditional territory of the Kwan Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. Uh, for the fourth week in a row, we have no active cases of COVID-19. This is very good news, uh, and it would not be possible without the diligence of every single Yukoner uh, doing their part to keep our territory safe. So thank you. Thank you very much. We're very fortunate to be in this position, but we are not out of the woods yet. And I know I sound like a broken record, but again, uh, it's important that we continue to take precautions so that we can minimize the risk of COVID-19 spreading in our territory. The best thing that we can do is to maintain the safe six. Wash your hands often, maintain physical distancing, stay at home if you're feeling sick, traveling responsibly and respectfully, self-isolating as required, and following gu gathering guidelines that are in place that include limiting indoor gatherings to 10 people. Also, remember to mask up in public. This past weekend, we received another shipment of vaccines from the federal government. This is good news as we continue to deliver the second shots uh, to those who received their first shots in January. Uh, this week, residents of long-term care and high-risk health care workers are getting their second dose. I know the team was in Dawson yesterday to, uh, at the McDonald Lodge, and they're providing second shots to uh, first responders as well. I want to reassure all those who have received their first shot that your second shot is here, it's safe, and it's waiting for you. We have enough vaccines to give second doses to everyone who receives their first dose. I want to thank every member of our mobile vaccine teams, Balto and Togo, for their work on the rollout uh, for the first shots, the first rounds of shots in the communities. I want to thank everyone in the communities who have taken their shot and the teams that continue to roll through those towns. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Uh, I had a really great opportunity to talk with some members of Togo. Um, I remarked, as my community of Dawson remarked, about the professionalism, the positivity, uh, the ability to work out details and issues. Um, very proud of, of both of these teams and uh, we love to see them rolling through the communities. Thank you for all the work that you do, both uh, Balto and Togo. The second shot uh, can create a stronger uh, effect than the first one, and I know that Dr. Hanley will have more to say on that uh, about the second shot. Uh, but simply put, the stronger reaction is to be expected, and it is a sign that the vaccine is working. We will continue to roll out the second shot in the same order in which we provided the first shot. Those who have received their first shot uh, can visit the booking website to make your appointment very soon. Uh, we hope to be in a position to soon announce uh, when we can continue with the uh, first round vaccine shots here in Whitehorse. We are still waiting uh, for the federal government to confirm the details around the supply of vaccines in the coming weeks, and we will have information, more information to share very soon. Uh, I have told my federal counterparts in no uncertain terms that they need to stick to their commitment of prioritizing vaccines for the North to protect our rural and indigenous communities. We continue to receive assurances that we will receive our full allotment of doses in the first quarter of 2021. As we get in, uh, additional information from the federal government, we will keep Yukoners up to date. The vaccine is a very important step in our fight against COVID-19, not just here, but across the country and across the world. The vaccines will continue to save lives as more people get immunized, and every Yukoner that wants a vaccine will receive immunization. For now, we need to remember uh, to be patient and to continue to protect each other. 
uh, as the sun shows up more and more every day and hopefully the weather starts getting better, uh, we still need folks to remain vigilant and patient. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have no active cases, but we know how quickly that can change. We all are hearing news from Newfoundland and also from, uh, from Skagway as well. Let's keep doing what we do. Newcomers, uh, to keep our neighbors, our elders, our families safe and healthy, continuing to practice the safe six, mask up, and again, be excellent to everybody. Thank you very much, and uh, pass it off to Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier Silver. Dr. Hanley? Thank you, Premier Silver. And uh, good morning, Montmartin. A month without cases is definitely something to note and to be grateful for. And I'm grateful to all Yukoners for contributing to keeping COVID out of our territory. But a lull like this can also seem like an opportunity to relax and start to ease off our measures. As we ourselves witnessed in December, or as Nunavut and most lately Eastern Newfoundland have demonstrated, COVID can, however, return and come back to bite in an instant. The one thing that has clearly been shown to prevent the spread of disease is the collection of public health measures that have been put in place, whether here in Yukon or anywhere else in the world. Each small measure is part of the layering of protections, and each person's action contributes to our whole community being protected. Although washing your hands, wearing a mask, and keeping your distance from people outside of your household may seem like small things, they collectively make a huge impact. <clears throat> These small things are what is keeping COVID at bay right now. We need to continue to push through the depths of winter and through these next few months. We may well be feeling confident with our current situation in Yukon. I know from experience that it's just, I think we know, from experience that it's just a matter of time until we see COVID here again. And that is the reality of this pandemic, that we are not completely immune from it, even though we can do much to prevent its spread if imported into the territory. As we see numbers begin to flatten across the country, measures and lockdowns are being lifted in many areas. With variants also being identified more and more, we can continue to hope that the downward trend continues and that there won't be need for a rebound in restrictions. We must temper our hope, though, with caution. It's important that we all continue to be cautious, to be aware, and to follow public health measures. The choices we make today, how we travel, getting tested when symptoms occur, staying away from others when sick, observing all the safe six plus one. These choices today could well determine how our next few months will be. Variants continue to be a topic of conversation, and week by week we continue to learn more about them. For example, Israel's experience with the Pfizer vaccine shows promising results, not just on the real-world effectiveness of this mRNA vaccine, but provides evidence that the vaccine seems very effective against the B117 variant that now predominates in Israel. Also, the vaccine appears to limit transmission of COVID infection, and this is a type of evidence that we are all waiting for. These are very encouraging findings that support how effective these vaccines are. Meanwhile, the variants continue to find their niche in Canada. They are now established in numerous areas, and it is inevitable that variant strains will spread further. Yukon, of course, is not immune, at least not yet. Just as we are likely to see more cases of COVID, it is quite possible that these cases will involve one or more variants. This is another reason that we have to continue to be cautious. While there are no active cases of COVID here, there are many cases within range of Yukon. We must continue to act as if COVID is here, even when it feels like something unlikely or far away. Let's continue to keep our bubbles small, keep our travel local as much as we can, and follow the Safe 6 plus 1 diligently. Remember to always take symptoms seriously. If you have fever, cough, loss of taste and smell, 
or difficulty breathing, or any other symptoms that are listed in the self-assessment tool, stay home and away from others and get tested. We want to find cases to keep everyone informed, alert, and safe. As we continue to make strides in the vaccine rollout, there are a few recent developments that I want to address. First, I'm very pleased to say that as of the end of yesterday, we have offered first doses to 10,604 individuals and 830 have received their second dose already. We have completed all the community visits as scheduled. Again, I want to congratulate Team Fox, who has been undertaking all the long-term care immunizations, as well as Team Balto and Togo, who were traveling in the communities. And I must equally thank all the teams behind the scenes, whether in planning, IT, or logistics. The reception of these teams in the communities has been outstanding, and thanks to those who greeted the teams with warm welcomes and open arms. This experience has shown again how Yukoners have been incredibly supportive and close, especially in this time of crisis. It is awe-inspiring and humbling to be part of this incredible community effort and community spirit. As we continue our rollout of first and second doses, we are looking forward to the next allocation and then confirmation on the dates of the March vaccine shipments so that we can proceed with the, with the White Horse Public Clinics. I appreciate your collective patience as we all wait for the news and as we have had to adjust schedules and be as flexible as possible. Without doubt, there will be more twists and turns along the way, but we are still on track for a very successful campaign. Meanwhile, the vaccine clinics proceed with second doses, and these are going well. I know there have been stories and rumblings about people getting side effects with second doses. I want to provide some clarity on the second dose and prepare people for what to expect when their time comes to receive that vaccination. First of all, yes, second doses are a pain in the arm. Most people will notice the second dose more than the first, especially people younger than 65 or so. This isn't necessarily a negative thing. When these common side effects are felt, it means that the immune system is responding as planned. Your body is being challenged, literally, to prepare to fight off COVID-19 if it were to attack. Experiencing symptoms following a second dose of vaccine is telling you that the vaccine is working. However, not everyone will get these symptoms, and those who may be disappointed with how good they feel can feel still confident in their body's immune response. So what should you expect second time around? Many people experience effects like soreness or even swelling at the site of, uh, of the injection, a slight fever, possibly muscle aches, fatigue, a headache. These symptoms will vary from person to person. Some will experience very mild symptoms, while others may feel like they actually have COVID-19. To understand the effects, let's look briefly back at how the vaccine works. Remember that the vaccine contains messenger RNA. This RNA instructs the body cells to build a copy of the COVID-19 spike protein. This protein then elicits a powerful immune response from the body, both antibodies and cellular machinery that quickly develops to fight this protein and thus the COVID-19 virus should it come to in invade. This immune response, especially when boosted with the second dose, is what causes the collection of symptoms, whether the sore arm at the injection site or the more general symptoms such as muscle aches and fatigue. People may feel under the weather for a day or so, sometimes a little longer, but rarely more than two or three days. Think of it like this. Your first dose feels like a bit of a practice run. You may be slightly tired, maybe have a bit of a muscle ache, as if you would after working out, but you don't notice a significant difference from how you feel on a usual day. The second dose is more like a big game. You may feel a bit weak afterwards, quite tired, and your body may feel drained. Again, this is just the effect of priming the immune system. It's your body's way of telling you 
that is getting ready to protect you from COVID-19. Most of the time, these symptoms resolve quite quickly. They are a transient and mild reminder of what COVID infection can be like. The price we pay, you might say, to prevent the potential for severe or long-lasting COVID-19 disease. When you have received your second dose, stay home if you're feeling ill enough. In most cases, that won't be necessary, but in a few cases, it may be. In the clinical trials, mild side effects after the second dose were common, but effects such as fatigue, fever, or headache that were enough to keep someone at home were mostly in the 1-5% to range. Remember that usually these effects pass quickly, but also remember that supports are in place for both employers and employees if you need to take a sick day after receiving the vaccine. If you want to play it safe, plan the dosing around a time where it may be easier for you to rest and take it easy. At the same time, never forget the chance of actual COVID infection. If symptoms persist more than a day, consider whether you might have COVID infection. Call 811 or talk to your healthcare provider if you're concerned. As always, follow the testing self-assessment tool online. Now, even though you may feel some adverse effects, it is critical that you receive that second dose in order to ensure that you are protected against COVID. It's a small price to pay for such good protection. As we continue our quest towards vaccination, I know that not everyone is feeling ready. As long as vaccines have been around, so has there been skepticism and resistance. For those with questions and who feel not quite ready, I'm hoping that we can continue to answer those questions that you have and point you to reliable sources of information. Everyone should check their sources when making decisions regarding vaccination. We are living in an age where misinformation is as, is as accessible as the facts and where deceptive practices are ever more artful and creative. Communications can be altered easily in a way that mimics similar communications from a government source. If you receive something in the mail, see a poster while you're out at the grocery store, or are scrolling through Facebook and see a post, always check the facts from credible sources. I've said before, though, that everyone deserves to have their questions answered and that everyone should feel as confident as I will at the moment of vaccination. I will keep trying to ensure that Yukoners have the proper resources that, and, and resources and information they need to make an informed decision. As we enter year two of this pandemic, we're all feeling a little tired and certainly fed up. But once more, we are in critical times where our decisions could have a proud, profound effect on our future. This pandemic will end. But once we find ourselves on the other side of COVID-19, we will be able to say that we all did our part to, co to keep COVID-19 out of this territory and out of this country. Did you do everything you could to protect yourself and those around you? As Yukoners, we want to reinstate the things that allow us to experience the world around us without restriction. We want to see and play and explore with our families and friends again. We hope to see our children, nieces, nephews, and grandchildren go up in a place without the pandemic's looming menace. We don't want to stay stuck in this restricted environment, but we can't do any of that until we can say with confidence that our community's health and well-being is protected. So please let's all consider doing our part and taking this incredible opportunity to get immunized against COVID. Vaccine is both our responsibility and our reward. And with this vaccine, we will find our way out of the pandemic. And that's all for my update. Thank you. Remember to take care of each other and stay well. Merci, Cho. Merci. Thank you. We'll move now to questions from reporters and we'll begin with Haley, Yukon News. Thank you. Um, my first question, I know it's hard to speculate right now, but with the White Horse Mass Clinic um, getting the doses before the end of Q1, is there a kind of extended timeline we can expect to see that date? Will the clinic likely take place in March, for example? Um, I think 
you know, there's been a lot of conversations this week with federal counterparts. <clears throat> we're cautiously optimistic, uh, and uh, we believe that we'll be getting the certainty that we're looking for very soon. Um, at the, I know the, this time last week I said that we were going to uh, have a conversation with all the premiers and the prime minister right after the uh, uh, the press conference. At that uh, conference, you can imagine the pressure the prime minister is under from every single region in Canada, uh, with uh, all the premiers expecting and wanting to know more certainty. Um, so you know those conversations continued on this week, and. Um, even though there's a, a, um, some speculation of, you know, nationally uh, vaccines being uh, being sent out f f further and further than what Ottawa has been confirming, at the meeting last week and again this week, they reconfirmed that they do not believe that the temporary slowdowns in Moderna and Pfizer is going to affect their long-term vision. They're still saying September for the rest of Canada, and they're still saying that distribution here in Yukon in the first quarter. Um, do we have dates for those uh, shipments? Not yet. And those dates are really the important piece. You know, we have enough vaccines here now with the confirmed deliveries and the ones we have now for second doses of everybody we've given uh, a, an original dose for, but we're still waiting to know specific amounts and times in that first quarter. You know, uh, Ottawa, again, is not saying that any of the speculations past that are true. They're staying close to uh, staying to the, the narrative of first quarter for delivery and uh, we're putting the pressure on again uh, my my message to Ottawa uh, stay with your commitment to northern rural and indigenous communities uh, and also you know with the information that we have based upon a very successful campaign so far on the Yukon with our mobile teams with uh, like team Fox and others uh, to be able to de to, to deliver uh, we we are saying we can deliver at least a thousand vaccines a day and we're ready uh, for those deliveries. And we do expect to have an update on dates and times very soon. Next question, Haley. Thank you. Um, my other question was again for you, Premier. Okay. Um, the legislature is expected to sit again in March. Are you planning to call a spring election? Nothing. Did, uh, nothing in my notes right here about a spring election. Uh, again, uh, we're we're concentrating right now on deliveries and vaccines right now. Okay. Thank you. We'll move to Luke CKRW. I have a question for Premier Silver as well. I was just wondering if you could confirm that the most recent shipment uh, that of doses that we got was 4,500. Yes. And that's the only question I have. Thank you. Okay. And, and we do have another shipment uh, confirmed at 4,500 as well, I believe, coming. So, but as far as the dates, we're still, yeah, still wondering about the dates. But that's the that's the update so far. <laughs> Thank you. I will move to Steve, CBC. Uh, hi, this question is for Dr. Hanley. For people who are immunocompromised with chronic disease, obesity, diabetes, et cetera, in Whitehorse, um, when can they get their shot? And will they get prioritized access, or will they just have to wait until the general public get it? Yeah, uh, I certainly have have received, <clears throat> excuse me, Steve, a lot of questions <clears throat> along the same lines, either either from individuals or groups, and and uh, this is also part of the planning um, in Canada for the sort of the second and third stages of vaccine um, offer as, you know, vaccine supplies nationally come in. So I, I want to say that the the overriding priority when we have had to prioritize is in um, older age age groups, so that that you know that's the seventy plus a start. Uh, our focus on long term care, um, because by far and away uh, the highest uh, risk um, of more severe infection correlates with age, <clears throat> and of course by addressing these increments of age down to 60 plus as we've already done in uh, in Whitehorse and of course we've widely covered community populations then we're covering a really broad swath of people who have these underlying conditions because the presence of underlying conditions increases with age so our hope really then is because we are able to once we have the vaccine, once we have our doses, we can go very quickly and, and, and really incorporate so many of those other priority groups that the rest of Canada will have to address um, 
in, in, in a much more staged manner than we will. So we have the advantage, you, you know, we, we can list um, uh, caregivers of um, older people. Uh, we can think of um, essential, um, essential workers. We can think of um, non-frontline healthcare workers. We can think of uh, first responders and people with a, a whole variety of underlying medical conditions, people with disabilities. Many of those categories we can kind of address all at once because we can do so much of the population quickly uh, within really a matter of weeks because we can ramp up very quickly. So that is our, our approach is to address all of those those um, non-first tier priorities, you might say, at, according to the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, um, in, in, in one broad go. Next question, Steve. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question is for the Premier and Dr. Hanley as well. Uh, the UK, this is kind of following up on Haley's question. Um, the Yukon Party says your party is creating uncertainty by not letting Yukoners know if a general election will be held during the spring. In theory, there's nothing stopping you from announcing a date at this very moment. And I realize that you're busy with the pandemic and all that. And of course, you know, it's just in general, parties with power generally wait until poll numbers are high, et cetera, to give them an edge, whatever. But do you believe it's responsible not to give out a specific date now, given all the com complexities we've had to adapt to, uh, given that we're in a pandemic? And then as for Dr. Hanley, I know that you've weighed in on at least one timing-related matter last year, specifically that MLAs should finish the budget, quote, as soon as possible, unquote, and focus instead on preparing for COVID-19. So in that spirit, when do you think the territorial general election should be held and how much notice should you Connors, should you Connors receive, um, namely to keep things safe? Yeah, I, you know, what the opposition has been saying since August is asking about an election since August. Um, that's interesting. Uh, it's not like I have a date in my head that uh, I'm holding from anybody. Uh, it doesn't, it's not that simple. There's lots of uh, moving pieces. There's lots of uh, reasons, uh, you know, for, for a call of an election. Uh, you know, we're concentrating right now on vaccine distribution. Um, you know, just the other day, I think it was until three in the morning, back and forth with Ottawa on conversations. And so credit to people in Ottawa that stayed up all night talking to Yukon. Uh, this is what we're doing right now. The opposition, they can continue to talk and speculate and, and drum up whatever they want to do as far as uh, elections uh, uh, speculations. Uh, we're going to continue to work hard here for Yukoners on the vaccine and get that figured out. We have uh, gone through the budgeting exercises all uh, winter long as well with all of the departments. Um, we focused very heavily on uh, relief for Yukoners for COVID, uh, questions about how, um, how uh, recovery starts after relief, pushing the federal government to give more information from their budget perspective as to, you know, are we looking at program relief or recovery in, in the federal uh, budget. There's so much work being done right now that we're concentrating on, uh, and, uh, and that's what we're focusing in on. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention to to uh, opposition speculation on elections, but I do know that they've been asking for one since August. And since I'm asked to weigh uh, to weigh in, um, not that I'm going to uh, um, fuel any speculation. That is not uh, certainly not my role. I think the 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 call to arms um, that I meant that you mentioned that I made um, a year or so ago. Um, was really, um, you know, we're entering an emergency. Uh, there are things I believe we really need to urgently focus on, and and uh, and let's let's get on with it, kind of thing. And uh, and I think now we're, we're in a very different time, where where of of course there are there are still many urgent questions to be answered every day, but we are in a we are in a stable um, position. So I think um, uh, there there are others who have important considerations, and I will, as is appropriate, let uh, let those considerations uh, play out. 
What I will say is that um, wh whatever happens, um, w we are ready, um, and we have um, already foreseen um, if there were um, an election to be called, whether that's now or later, um, w because we know that the, the clock is ticking ultimately, um, that we um, that that we will be prepared to be able to support. Um, um, a safe and uh, a safe campaign where um, full participation um, can occur right up to election day. Thank you. We'll move to Tim Whitehorse Star. Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, my first question is uh, pertaining to the question of easing restrictions. We're four weeks into no active cases, and uh, people are undoubtedly getting restless. And a lot of questions I'm hearing, for instance, we have a film festival going on at the moment, and there are some live events, but wouldn't it be nice if you could open up the restrictions so that more people could go to that, or maybe even on a restricted basis, the main movie theaters? What's the point of continuing with all these restrictions when we've done so well? Uh, I'll, uh, I'm sure Dr. Hanley will have lots to say on this. Um, I have not seen... Dr. Hanley waver to public events in any of his recommendations. It's always been based upon the most up-to-date science and epidemiology, um, and also a careful balance between keeping people safe due to COVID and also uh, understanding the mental health uh, of being a little more cooped up than normal. Um, so <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, every recommendation that I will be getting moving forward from the Chief Medical Office uh, and his team will be based upon that science. Um, I do also, you know, we're, we're, we do know that, you know, the epidemiology in Vancouver, you know, we're looking at uh, rates there now that if you were looking just as a per capita, like how many cases, we're at about October, early October levels uh, right now in, in BC. Uh, and, you know, we have this conversation on a weekly basis about epidemiology in other areas. It's the variant that uh, is causing concern this time around and really adds credence to what I've been hearing from Dr. Hanley and his team all through this pandemic, it's not a per capita uh, consideration. There's always a bunch of variables to consider. Uh, but we are all very cautiously optimistic of um, the the planking or the reduction of the curve uh, right across Canada right now. And uh, we will continue to work forth in a methodical and, uh, and scientific manner when it comes to opening up our uh, uh, some of our restrictions. Yeah. Um, I, I think... Um the premiers captured the key elements of that very well. I'm um, certainly always aware of of the need to uh, strike the best balance that we can uh, between uh, the restrictions that uh, we advise that need to be in place <clears throat> and the um, ability to um, to 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 be human, to thrive, to have, uh, to to be able to uh, gather in whatever ways we can. Um, uh, and uh, be because that we we need to do that as humans, and and to carry out a, a living, to make a living, to have a, to have as best an economy as we can manage under the restrictions. So the, this is very much a, a balance that we always need to be looking at and are looking at to see how we can reset. Um, and so um, I, and I talked a, a, a bit about the key themes last week, um, which is this: the, what we're seeing play out in the months to come is the the kind of the 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 game as it were between the variants and the vaccine and there's there's lots we still have to learn about that we i i think we have just seen what's happened in st john's and mount pearl and that is, um, and even the the chief medical officer, Dr. Fitzgerald, who mentioned uh, that that uh, C word of complacency, as perhaps having contributed, and and it's that feeling that we're doing so well, we're doing so well, and then all of a sudden. Uh, there's an introduction, and uh, there's spread, um, and suddenly and you have widespread uh, disease, and, and now uh, a rebound in restrictions. And I, I would much rather uh, kind of play that uh, game where we can we can be cautious and 
and slow enough with what we do so that we can avoid those sudden turns of, of events um, and, and maintain a steady course. So we are definitely looking at what we can do uh, depending on how... Um, uh, how how the variants play out and how the epidemiology continues. Uh, as I mentioned, we're seeing some really encouraging signs in the rest of Canada, and that will definitely influence what we might look forward to um, in in the months ahead. So, again, to tr I, I I really encourage people not to focus so much on the four weeks of non-activity. That's that's something we're all grateful for. But it's always based on risk. Risk of introduction, and therefore, how do we mitigate the risk of spread when there is an introduction? And now playing into that is, uh, is the variance. And we will learn more with time on how much we can depend on protection from the, from the vaccine. And, how, and that will definitely um, uh, be playing an influence also in the, our ability to advise on uh, lifting of measures. So very much conversations that we're having and analysis that we're doing every day, and uh, there'll be uh, a lot more to come on that in the weeks and months ahead of us. Next question, Tim. Yes, I'd uh, like to return to the uh, subject of uh, side effects of the second dose. We saw earlier this week that there were significant numbers of people in uh, health and social services off the job because of these effects. It, it sounds like it's going to be a tough sell for people who might be characterized as vaccine hesitant. Premier Silver? I, I definitely want to address that. Um, I'll start with it's simply not true that 60% of continuing care workers were off the job last Friday. Uh, and I think that that's irresponsible to spread uh, misinformation uh, and, and potentially stroking, stoking fears about the vaccine rollout. Uh, there were some uh, uh, staff that were impacted by a second shot, uh, but we're, ta we're talking about approximately 10% of our continuing care staff. Uh, that number is not unusually high and and uh, and it did not impact the level of service that was provided to residents um, I'll say that you know because of uh, vulnerable populations uh, at that continuing care uh, you know uh, facilities you know the staff are encouraged to stay at home uh, at any sign of, of illness uh, this is definitely a precautionary step that is taken to ensure that Residents um, are are safe, and uh, and don't come into contact with illness by way of staff. Um, this applies to illness in the community. It also uh, it applies to COVID nineteen. Uh, I think that the staff have done an amazing job, and the care for uh, from the supervisors for making sure that if people are f experiencing uh, adverse effects, uh, you know, I think that they did a great job. And you know, any of the uh, conditions that we saw were uh, within the realm of what we knew to be expected from that second uh, from that second uh, vaccination dr. Henley yeah uh, this is maybe going back a again uh, as the premier opened uh, the, his answer with uh, um, looking for um, credible sources of information because there was definitely um, I was also upset to see the misleading information that was distributed and the potential for how that might influence confidence in in the vaccine uh, so yes, there are side effects, and yes, side effects are going to be worse in uh, with the second dose. Um, but as I say, um, we we expect you know really to be significant enough to uh, have a have um, a day um, p potentially off work or of rest or at home is in that five to ten percent range, and that's what bore out with long term care in a setting where we are particularly cautious. In um, these are healthcare workers. These are healthcare workers that are screened uh, daily for a very good reason because they're working in a closed, uh, in a closed uh, um, setting, where we have vulnerable residents. And of course, we we uh, I think everyone knows the reasons for being so careful as as we are with uh, long term care. So some of those people with symptoms related to vaccine <clears throat> screened in were were therefore um, on sick uh, on sick leave for that day and were covered appropriately as as really happens on a daily basis and uh, those uh, those symptoms proved to be uh, to be temporary 
and uh, there were um, there was an assessment where some of those um, some of those people had symptoms that were concerning enough that uh, testing was advised through uh, YCDC. Um, all of those tests were were negative, as expected. But that's part of our very prudent and careful approach because sometimes there may have been an exposure to COVID uh, that that was otherwise uh, undetected. So. We have to be careful not to assume that all effects are due to vaccine, especially if those um, effects are more severe or if they're longer lasting or if they involve those um, those kind of red flag uh, or red light symptoms that we've previously highlighted. So again, uh, a lot of caution. I think that uh, when we get to the public uh, second doses, we will have uh, kind of a, a ripple of effects of a, a, a very few people who might be um, needing to take uh, some downtime because of side effects, but the vast majority uh, will um, will be able to carry on just fine. And that's what the, the data is telling us all around uh, North America. Thank you. We'll move now to Claudiane, Radio-Canada. Oui, je suis désolée, Dr. Henley, en français. J'aimerais aussi euh, que vous me parliez, peut-être pas dans autant de détails, mais de, de cette deuxième dose et de l'impact, de l'effet qu'on a vu, euh, si vous avez exactement les chiffres du nombre de travailleurs qui ont été affectés euh, par ces euh, symptômes avec la deuxième dose en français, s'il vous plaît. So the question is for Dr. Henley. Could you please repeat in French, uh, what are the effects of the second dose? What can people can expect out of this second dose? And if you can also cover the numbers of people that have been affected by these symptoms at this point. Oui, merci pour la question. Euh, donc, uh, pour, pour, pour dire une chose, um, euh, tout trois, c'est que la deuxième dose de Moderna, ça, ça prend plus des effets secondaires euh, que la première dose. Et c'est euh, c'est parce que ça augmente la la réponse euh, immunologique. Donc euh, donc c'est un bon signe, c'est un signe positif, même que c'est euh, même que ça vienne avec euh, deux fois de douleur, des euh, des, des douleurs, la fatigue. Euh, c'est un bon signe parce que ça signifie une réaction euh, euh, d'immunité qui, qui, qui va être donc la, la protection qu'on euh, euh, qu cherche euh, contre le, le COVID-19 euh, virus. Donc, donc la, le, les deux sortes des effets secondaires sont des effets locaux et les effets euh, syst plus systémiques ou plus euh, de corps en général. Et donc, pour les, euh, pour les premiers euh, effets, c'est euh, effectivement ces douleurs, peut-être euh, enflement euh, à, à le, le site d'injection, euh, de froid, de, 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 de rougeur aussi. Et, euh, et c'est les, les effets euh, systémiques pour le corps, c'est euh, un mal de tête, deux fois la fatigue et euh, des douleurs du muscle. Euh, de, euh, et donc, euh, il, les effets sont communs. C'est la, la plupart des gens, par exemple, vont avoir une, euh, une, une douleur euh, euh, du, du bras autour de la site d'injection. Mais la plupart sont euh, euh, sont très doux et c'est seulement dans la catégorie de 5 jusqu'au 10 que les personnes euh, ont à, assez fortes les symptômes qu'il faut peut-être prendre un jour à, à la maison ou à pas aller à, à l'école. C'est important de toujours considérer une, une question est-ce qu'il y a un exposé au COVID Est-ce qu'il faut euh, il faut euh, peut-être euh, considérer un test, surtout si les symptômes sont plus sévères ou plus longs de longue durée. Et donc, on est conseillé de toujours suivre euh, l'information sur les euh, euh, sur le besoin pour le, les, les critères pour avoir un test de COVID. Mais pour la plupart des gens, après un jour, deux jours, les symptômes euh, sont euh, sont déjà euh, déjà améliorés. Euh, 
Euh, et euh, pour nous, pour les euh, sections de, de soins long terme, on a, on a vu plus ou moins les mêmes effets. On, a, on avait euh, jusqu'au 10% de personnes qui avaient euh, assez de symptômes qu'ils étaient conseillés de prendre, la maison, prendre un jour à, à la maison, de prendre une, une, une journée de, de, de maladie. Et c'était bien couvert par, les, par les, euh, les, les personnels auxiliaires pour continuer de, de prendre soin des, des, des résidents de soins long terme. Thank you. Uh, prochaine question, Claudiane. Donc, à ce moment-ci, en fonction des informations que vous avez des, de la, du nombre de, de vaccins, de doses que vous avez reçues, L'immunité collective euh, qu'on vise, non pas maintenant à la fin mars, à la fin quoi? On parle de la fin avril, on parle du mois de mai, on parle de l'été. À ce moment-ci, avec les informations qu'on a, quand est-ce qu'on pense pouvoir avoir atteint 75 de vaccination? So, given the numbers that we have at this point, the number of vaccines that we have received, the number of people that have been vaccinated, and what we can foresee in the future coming, uh, when can we expect to have achieved herd immunity, and when can we expect to have achieved the 75% that was targeted in the beginning of the campaign? Just anecdotally, I can start. Um, you know, we're, um, you can imagine the communities that are first in, in, to, uh, in North America, you know, if you have a, a rural community in Yukon, which would be one of the first communities in, in North America to have open vaccinations for a whole population, uh, that, that seemed to be daunting to, to some. Uh, to begin with, uh, but what we're seeing is, as you know, somebody's aunt gets vaccinated in one community, or you know, an elder in Dawson speaks to the reasons why they're going forth. We've seen uh, right across uh, Yukon uh, uh, really um, amazing community support for herd immunity. Uh, it, it, it's why we live here. You know, we we know that Yukoners are, are the types of people that want to do community things, that want to volunteer, that want to make sure that their communities are safe. And, and we're seeing that with COVID. Um, you know, with... Um, with the ability of the mobile teams to re-engage with communities, to go back, uh, what we're hearing anecdotally is, again, uh, people stepping up and the numbers are, we're, we're very happy with the numbers that we're seeing uh, in the rural communities. We're very, very happy to see um, the, the amount of continuing care workers, critical workers, uh, and, and uh, our elders getting vaccinated. Uh, and now it's, uh, it's, we're looking for certainty on our distribution of our vaccines. I would say the biggest factor right now in answering your question, Kajian, is, you know, when are the next uh, doses landing and how many are they in those in those time frames? Uh, on our part, the team uh, at, uh, at Health and Social Services and Dr. Hanley's team have done an impeccable job of educating and communicating and getting the vaccine out and, and, sh and proving to Ottawa our ability to, uh, to do um, Uh, a, a Herculean effort of small communities all the way through to uh, to having a, com a community here in Dawson, or sorry, in Whitehorse, ready to go with uh, with mass vaccinations. So the ball's in the court of the federal government, uh, and uh, when we get our vaccines in, we'll get them into arms as quickly and as, uh, and, uh, as safely as possible, and uh, we'll be able to answer those speculative questions at that time. Dr. Henley? We... Um Merci. Et, et pour peut-être prendre quelques points du, du, premier, um, du premier ministre, um, il, y a, il y a des chiffres, uh, peut-être les catégories de chiffres, uh, uh, qu'on on attend toujours les, uh, sûrement le les fournissement um, de vaccins. Donc, ça dépend de, de compte uh, éventuellement que où on sait et, 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 et quand l'arrivée de vaccins sont, euh, sont, sont, sont finis. Et donc, et ça, ça pour aller, ça c'est la, la, la première peut-être tranche, c'est pour aller jusqu'au euh, 75% de la population. La deuxième chiffre, c'est combien de gens viennent à recevoir le vaccin euh, et, et 
et, euh, et ça c'est euh, comme, comme le premier ministre a dit euh, on, a, on a une très bonne réception mais on a, on a toujours euh, des, des reprises à, à faire euh, jusqu'on arrive euh, au le, le, le but le, le but courant d'aller au euh, 75% donc peut-être ça va prendre même si on a tous les, les fournissements tous les, les vaccins dans le territoire pour par exemple le mois de, de mars ou avril ça peut peut-être prendre des semaines ou, ou même des mois après ça pour, pour éventuellement arriver partout au, au le même chiffre. Euh, mais je suis optimiste qu'on peut aller jusqu'au là. Mais le, le troisième chiffre, c'est quel est le, quel, éventuellement qu'est-ce que c'est la, la taux, qu'est-ce que c'est le but actuel. Parce, et à ce moment, on ne sait pas le cible exact pour qu'est-ce qu'il y a la herd immunity ou qu'est-ce qu'il y a, qu -ce qu y a la, la immunité euh, communautaire euh, est-ce que c'est 60% est-ce que c'est enfin euh, 70-75% est-ce que c'est plus haut on ne sait pas exactement parce qu'on n'a pas l'évidence euh, à ce moment donc euh, c'est possible qu'on va arriver avant, euh, avant le, le grand nombre de, de 75% mais à ce moment on ne sait pas exactement le cible pour, euh, pour arriver à l'immunité uh, collective uh, dans, dans la communauté. I'll just maybe repeat a couple of the concepts in English just yes, to be yes. clear. And, and I'm saying that we, we, we still don't actually know what the number, the magic number is for herd immunity based on these, um, uh, these vaccines and also uh, based on the virus and the variants. So there's still a lot to determine what is, what is that magic number. And of course, um, so, so we are going with the 75% goal because that is the allocation um, at, uh, in these first rounds of the national allocation. It is based on the, the estimate of a 75% population uptake. So we will continue to work to get to that goal of 75% uptake, and I, I think we will get there. But it depends, of course, on supply, but it also depends eventually on on their, on, on that number of people agreeing to uh, to get the to to take the vaccine. So that's all the continuing work with communications and engagement and making sure people have all the information they need to make that decision. So when uh, and I'm optimistic we can get to 75%, and then maybe we'll go higher. We don't need to stop when we have eventually more supplies of vaccine um, into the second quarter. Um, I would imagine we can, we can continue to make sure that everyone um, who wants vaccine uh, uh, gets it. And if we go beyond 75%, that's even better for our collective immunity. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for their time this morning. The next COVID-19 update will take place on Thursday, February 18th at 9.30 a.m.